Welcome to Fraser View Church's online service. We're glad you're here with us. Today, Andrew is going to continue talking about our stained glass windows and the meaning behind them. I hope you have an opportunity to sit back and remember what it's like to be in the sanctuary and look up at the stained glass windows. But Nick will also embed those so that he can, you can see them as the preaching is going on. Follow along, sing along with us and um, yeah, answer the questions. Gather together with people around you, listen to the question, answer it, and do some thinking about how this relates to your life. Enjoy the service. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our song I miss seeing people at Fraser Youth's building. It isn't the same when it isn't filled with life. It is designed to aid us in following Jesus. And it is when Jesus shines through our shared life that we ex then experience the meaning and the belonging which occur when a community uh, gives and receives from one another. When we commit ourselves to living for the benefit of the others in our community, 
because we know that that community has an eternal or ongoing place as part of the new community which Jesus is bringing about in the world. That's what he's doing. He's re renewing and redeeming his creation. And of course, all this requires that we experience God, that we hear from him. And as we continue our journey through the stained glass windows here at Fraser View, we come to a, the lower set of images, which all recount God coming to people uh, through our historical family of faith that we find in the Old Testament. Last week, we noted how the light streams in from the left of the window, those brighter yellow stained glass tiles. And it demonstrated how God's action in creation was to bring his light into the darkness and to order the darkness so that life could exist there. But lower in the window, we see that there are three beams of light that come in, which each represent God coming to in particular historical moments. And they're coming to three different characters which are marked out in the window. And this aids us in visualizing how God comes to us to be with us, to shape and form us as his people. We usually call this revelation. God reveals himself to us. It is not possible for us to climb up to reveal God uh, to ourselves. And so this week we're going to reflect on those three forms of revelation that we find in the lower left hand window. At the time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden those things from the wise and the learned, and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and this to whom the Son chose to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burned, and I will give you rest. The first story is Abraham with Isaac on the altar from Genesis 22. You can see the knife raised and the boy laying on the stones if you look in closely at the window. I preached on this story in 2018 and you can probably find that sermon on the website if you want to refresh your memory of it. But the point I made there is that the story reveals God as the one who will provide the sacrifice. Abraham shows trusting obedience in God he has followed this far in his life. He lives in a world where he knows that gods often demand terrible things from people in repayment for the blessings that they have given them. But he does not think the God that he is following is like this. Instead, when questioned about the animal for this sacrifice, he assures Isaac that God will provide himself the lamb. And God does. What is revealed to Abraham through his faithful obedience, his trusting obedience, is that God he knows is not like the other gods in the ancient world. Instead of demanding a sacrifice, that God provides a sacrifice. A sacrifice which is personal and costly to the God who loves Abraham. A sacrifice which reveals that love and that commitment that comes with that love to walk with him in obedient trust. And so the question for us is, when has obedience to Jesus caused you to experience more of him? There have been a few times in my life when I've been part of a group or talking with a person when I have felt the weight of the Spirit encouraging me to say something I don't want to particularly say to them. The, the experience is different from when I am being direct with people about something that I care about. Instead it is usually initiated by the Spirit and something that usually doesn't, isn't a natural thing that I would desire to say to someone. It isn't something that comes from within me, instead it is a sense of the Spirit sitting on my life. And I experience various responses to this from people. Sometimes people hear it as the voice of the Spirit, they recognize it and they affirm it and they are grateful for it even if it has been hard to hear. And sometimes people reject it. They don't like it. They would prefer that I had not challenged them with what I thought the Spirit was saying. But in both situations I've come away with that sense that by being obedient I have spoken what Jesus was trying to speak in the situation and I have a sense of closeness with them. Um, and that closeness comes from the idea that I have been sharing in his work. 
That's the wonderful fruit of trusting obedience in God. I think that going to the school that I went to was an act of obedience towards Jesus. And I know that I approached it with a lot of trepidation as I considered what a worship arts degree would mean as far as a career. I definitely had a lot of people around me at the time saying, like, it's, it's not going to be very easy to find a job as a worship pastor, especially one that pays enough to live on. And so I took a risk of obedience and going to that school because it's what I felt called to um, by Jesus. And in taking that risk of obedience, uh, I found a community at that school which was uh, really influential for me, uh, not only in my faith, but also just in the people it introduced me to, uh, like some close friends and my wife. Um, but I also found that through that experience, it brought me here to Fraserview, which has been another community that has really helped me grow in my understanding of Jesus and my understanding of what it means to uh, be a Jesus follower and to be a leader uh, as Jesus leads me. I would have to say that the most profound encounter I had with Jesus was in the days, leading up, days and weeks leading up to my baptism and the day of my baptism. I feel that the fall of 2012 was a true transformational time for me. It was this moment of holy submission to the work of the Spirit in me. I was definitely not in the driver's seat during that time, which was a hard thing for me because I feel I always have been when it comes to my life. This call of obedience to be baptized as a believer required me to really wrestle and to put aside my prejudices and my understanding of baptism, an infant baptism that I had in the Catholic Church. I knew that I had some work to do at that time and the beautiful thing is that I had this opportunity to do that work with Jesus right alongside me, caring and having great compassion for me. I experienced an amazing connection with Jesus during that time, but what was beautiful is the Spirit working in me to give, to give me this insatiable thirst for knowing him more, that it didn't end at my baptism, but boy did it ever start at my baptism to have this beautiful encounter with my living Lord. The second character is Moses receiving the law and stone tablets in Genesis 31 to 34. Law in the ancient world could be translated as instruction. The idea, the concepts behind this, is that a good king would create laws or instructions for how a society, a community, would live together so that everyone would benefit and have an opportunity to flourish. Of course, this is still the ideal for how government should work in our, our world. So God as king instructed his people how to live in accordance with his creational design so that everyone could flourish and contribute according to the gifts that he has given them. And this goes beyond just the Ten Commandments written on the stone tablets. It includes the case law that we find in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and beyond. It includes the wisdom sayings throughout the Bible that speak about how to live well. And it includes all the stories and teachings which explain the underlying reasons for those many laws. Laws, of course, are a good way of preventing bad things from happening, but not good at causing good things to happen. And so when we get to Jesus, we see that he builds and modifies some of this history that he has experienced through his life in Israel. He always points back to God's original intention for his laws, sometimes setting them aside as out of date, sometimes reminding people of the original meaning, and sometimes giving new instructions for new situations. And Jesus, of course, uses his Sermon on the Mount as a way to give Beatitudes which describe the positive attitude of his followers. So as Christians, we're unusually attached to the Bible, to Scripture. The idea that God has taken this hot human re recording of his instructions with them, and he has empowered it with his own spirit, so that it will instruct and empower us to live according to his creational design. God speaks to us through Scripture. And as such, it's... It's revelation of God and revelation of the world, way the world is to work, how we are to live in community with each other, is of great value to us. And so I want to ask you today, how has the revelation of God's instruction for life changed how you live? The extreme capitalism which is present in our society is based on a competitive system. And that competition is about acquiring stuff, 
and the winner is the one who has the most stuff. But scripture reminds me of a very different way of thinking about the world. It reminds us that everything that we have is a gift given to us by God. There is nothing that makes us up us and that belongs to us. And scripture reminds us as well that at the end we don't get to take anything with us. You never see a hearse with a trailer. God's instruction for life is to make use of what he has given us so that we can create eternal, long-lasting things. And those are usually relationships, way of relating to people, way of benefiting people, way of growing and extending ourselves personally. And we do this by giving away who we are, um, giving away what we have been given in order to help the community flourish, help people flourish, help them enter into the wholeness, the peace, the shalom that God intends for his creation. The instructions that come to mind when I think about uh, the instructions of God that have been guiding my life is uh, specifically in the life of Jesus and the way that he modeled caring for the poor and for the oppressed. And like everything in my life, this is something that I need to do a lot of work on. But um, one of the areas that I know that I can do this uh, is through the way that I spend my money and the things that I uh, purchase. And so I've been making a concerted effort to buy clothing and to buy food from sources that are more ethical and more uh, oriented towards uh, paying their workers fairly and, uh, and not putting them in dangerous working conditions. And it's something that's quite simple in my life, something that doesn't actually require a lot from me. Uh, but the way that I spend my money is definitely a uh, an, an indicator of where my values are and so using my money to uh, help rather than hurt people uh, is a really important way for me uh, that I can follow Jesus and the instructions that he gives. This is a really powerful question for me because when I think about how the revelation of God's instructions for how I live came to me I really believe that it came to me before I was even aware of it. Um, it's hard for my simple brain to understand how that's possible, but I know that for God anything is possible. I feel like I have this spot in my heart that drives me to care for people who learn differently, who move differently, and who behave differently. And that spot has always occupied my heart. My life story does not reflect growing up with friends or family members who have disabilities. Instead, it's, it's kind of just always been in my heart. I didn't learn to include people who have disabilities. I didn't learn how to treat them with respect and dignity. I feel like that has been revealed to me. And the difference between something being learned, which puts me in control of what it is that I'm learning, and something that's revealed to me, which puts God in control around what he wants to reveal in me, is a vast, vast difference. And I really believe that my passion for supporting people who have disabilities to be included in this world and to have dignity is the work of God's revelation within me. It has nothing to do with what I've learned. The third character is the prophet kneeling by what looks like a cactus plant. Once again, the light is coming right down to him. God meets with someone who shows devotion to God and desires to hear his voice. This is an essential lesson for us. We all have a temptation to think that God isn't really interested in us. Either he's annoyed with us or he's just too busy for us. But God is always fascinated with us. He always wants to be in relationship with us. He wants to walk and to talk with us. And the prophet is a reminder that when we listen, God will speak. So God speaks to us. And we need to let that sink deeply into our lives. God doesn't always speak in an audible voice, but sometimes in a moment of insight, sometimes through other people, sometimes in a way a circumstance appears uh, among us. And he always speaks in scripture. And we need to ask ourselves, are we expectant to hear God's voice? And are we willing to follow Jesus as he speaks to us? To build in time in our lives so that we can familiarize and prioritize his voice. And then when we are out and about, we are already tuned into his voice so that we can hear him among the hustle and bustle of life. 
So how do you provide time to listen for God's voice? Include how you use and familiarize yourself with scripture to aid you in that process. Often when I am talking to someone, I am whispering in my head, God give me wisdom to care for this person. And this expresses a whole range of things for me in a compact way. That God speaks and helps others through my presence with them. That the most significant thing that I can offer to other people is Jesus. That Jesus has greater insight into the other person's life than I do. And that what Jesus is doing in someone's life is more significant than what I might want to do in their life. And of course when I listen in this way I often find that Jesus places ideas and scriptures into my head which may aid the person in their following of Jesus. And this practice helps me remain present with the person and helps me remain focused on my desire to serve that person as they follow Jesus. It opens the door for Jesus to be present with in the midst of that conversation. And of course it's all built on time that I've spent studying scripture and listening to God on my own, asking him what, I want, what he wants me to do with my day. It allows me to draw him into every moment of my life. And it's so precious that God desires to be with us like that and so that he speaks to us constantly. The key for me is that providing time for God to speak to me is an active task in my life. I think that I would often expect God to burst into my life and yell and scream at me the things that I need to hear from him. But in reality, when I take time aside to actually sit down and to listen, uh, whether that's through prayer or scripture uh, or worship music, um, God often finds ways to speak to me as long as I'm paying attention uh, and listening. I think recently of a course that I took with Lou, which I've mentioned here a few times, um, where we met with a, a group of uh, pastors and leaders uh, across Canada and America that were um, all talking about ways that we can live Jesus-centered lives uh, in a polarized world. And it was just through the discussions that we had with all these people who were like-minded in their pursuit of wanting to get to know Jesus and live their lives more like him that I found that God spoke to me in a, in a bunch of different ways and largely through scriptures that I've read uh, often before but uh, through discussion with other people who were uh, Christ-centered in their approach uh, God really illuminated uh, these these familiar scriptures to me again and so I'm a big believer that scripture is uh, well interpreted in community and so I think that uh, the importance of uh, not only reading the, the words that, that God gives to us but also speaking about it with uh, people who also care about uh, Jesus and living their lives like Jesus is. Uh, that's been a really important way for me to hear the voice of God recently. I've preached before how shifting our perspective can help us to see a situation, whether it's a challenging situation or a joyful situation, it helps us to see it in a different way. I love the visual of being above a situation, which is where I believe God is. And looking above, then I can look down at the situation from a whole different perspective. And, and I can ask myself, Lord, help me to see this situation as you see it. This makes me pause my voice, pause my knee-jerk reaction to what's happening, and to pause my evaluation about what is happening. And sometimes I'm able to actually hear scripture being spoken in my head um, and to see how Jesus would handle the situation that I'm encountering. This being, looking down, this, this idea of looking down and seeing a situation gives me this time to listen for his voice. But honestly, I need to learn to listen more silently so I can hear him more loudly. That's what I'm working on. The stained glass window reminds us that God is breaking into our lives, revealing himself to us, that he speaks to us as we faithfully obey, as we engage in scripture, and as we listen for his voice. And as a result at Fraserview, we prioritize listening for God. We fill our communal life with scripture and we set aside time to listen for his voice. 
all this so that we can faithfully and obediently fulfill our role as disciples of his, as followers of his. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly, or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumble are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food. 
but those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Thank you for joining with us today. We have a few reminders for you. Alpha Online through Zoom is starting up this Thursday, February 4th from 7 to 8.30. John Jansen is leading it and it would be a great opportunity for you to invite others to join in and to be part of the conversation. It runs for about eight to 10 weeks. Um, the link for the Zoom call in to be part of that Alpha Online is in the email, so please do check it out. We also encourage you to check out the resources for children and youth. The link is on the email and you can also find all of those resources on the website. As well, if you have furniture, old or new, that you're trying to rehome or find a new place for, I have people who are looking for furniture, so please connect with me. Apart from that, have a great week. Uh, celebrate the beautiful sunshine that's on its way. And um, we look forward to seeing you next week. Bless you and be well.